How are we doing? Everything okay? Has ChatGPT mentioned already this time? A bit? Well, I think it should. So, first of all, thank you for being here and help me in being a bit puzzled today about the things that happen with AV to get my slides up first. It's always great to see that happening. Because the thing that I want to share with you that I'm kind of puzzled with all the great stuff that we see happening. I was at the second Future Met at NASA Ames at first already and it's part of my oxygen. It always has been and it always will be. Ever since that moment, we've seen all the developments and everything else that's going on. But my question would be, is it enough? Are we fixing the right problem? And I actually think we are not. We're facing the problem at the rear end, and we're fixing it over there where we should do it at the front end of it. And that has been also my mission for many years. In ambulance services at first, and then I transitioned to Radboud University Medical Center, now helping Deloitte, Vodafone, and Laurentius Medical Center to make a soft landing into the future. And I actually think that we have a plumber's problem. We try to fix things with kettles and umbrellas, while the actual thing that we should do, what would you do if you see something like this? Not fixing the hole, you try to reach out to the main tap. So why is it when we look at healthcare and we know what the drivers of health are, like been discussed already, your DNA code for 20% makes the driver of your health. The postcode in the Netherlands, a well-developed country, I think, there are some places that matter for nine years of life expectancy under the average of the average Dutch citizen. Then we got your behavior and all things combined. So why is it that if only 6% of your health is being determined by healthcare interventions, that we still pour in 90% of our budget in that bucket? Because that's the reality. Ever since 2017, I've been using this slide to kind of predict or to warn actually that in 2035, we will have a doubling in healthcare demand, shortage of skilled personnel, burnout rates going through the roof, and patients knowing what they want. Healthcare system will, will implode. And that exactly is what happened during the peak of our pandemic. Code black, we had to make harsh choices. This was in a temporary fashion. If we don't do anything today, that will be a permanent phase in a couple of years from now. Because healthcare is facing this, what we like to call this perfect storm, from all kinds of sides. We've coming out of this pandemic right now with big choices to make, and it already was a system under pressure, organizational under pressure, financial under pressure, emotional under pressure. We see what's happening with this crocodile mouth. Doubling in healthcare demand, declining numbers of people getting into healthcare, and like I said, by 2035, this will be the problem. So my assertion is that we need to carve out up to 30% of the current healthcare out of the healthcare system. So this is not budget-wise. This is taking a different approach, bringing healthcare to other places, and to look outside what's happening outside, and making sure that we learn from that. Because that's the thing that we can do. If you look outside, like payments, we all do this by plastic or your phone and very soon with your eyes. If we order stuff, we do it online and groceries are bringing this up to your own fridge for nine bucks extra every month. And if you need to travel, we use technology, we use digital boarding cards. And maybe in due time, my wife and I will become grandparents and I will talk to my grandchildren, brag about we had this little booklet that we needed for travel. And in the US, in a couple of places already, your driver's license and very soon also your passport is in the app. We're living a digital society already. So we need to make a choice right now, right here. Are we going to add digital to the things that we do? Or do we flip it around? Making everything on a digital platform at first, unless, unless science proves us wrong, unless you as a professional say, this is not what we want, unless patients say, this is not what I want. And that's the interesting thing, because many in healthcare still think it's like building an app. Well, it's not. It's about user interface, how things work, how we explain stuff. And in the Netherlands, our own Ministry of Health has this new mantra, 
where they say it's about yourself. You need to do it yourself if possible. You need to do it at home if possible. And you need to do it digital if possible. And the interesting, st interesting thing about technology is that in the old days, the physician would visit your home and all the technology would fit in this doctor's bag. And then we started to build huge places to fit all the technology. Meanwhile, all the technology is shrinking. All the stuff that we had at our desk now all of a sudden is in your phone, very soon in your glasses, and after that in your lenses. And if we trust Elon Musk, it's like a in the back end of your head with Neuralink. That's the reality that we see. And this one's too good to share. Like a robot chasing a sperm cell, finding the egg. This is what we're able to do already. So why is it that we're not using these kind of things already in healthcare on the other side than fixing stuff? We're living this fourth industrial revolution. We all know that. We've been living that. We, we talk about Moore's Law. By the way, Moore's Law is kept alive in the Netherlands. ASML is a Dutch company treating Moore's Law and keeping Moore's Law alive. And one of the inventors of uh, Chat GPT says the new version of Moore's Law is the doubling of intelligence in the universe. That's interesting. With technology, and I was proud to, from my friend Dave, to have the very first strip at the back end of my phone in Europe, start using that, and we see how that evolved very soon also and be became mainstream. Interesting enough, we see these developments on a monthly basis already. And for instance, a company like Philips is now creating an ultrasound knob connecting to your smartphone, offering GPs the opportunity to do things in their own practice. Using digital humans like this one, I brought the technology from New Zealand and Australia to the Netherlands where you could choose which kind of digital human, male, female, gender neutral, speaks 14 languages, ethnicity. We've implemented that as the world's first digital pharmacist in St. Martin's Clinic in the Netherlands. My friends are here already as well, by the way. Or what to think about these kind of technology fitting in your toilet, having this urine lab already present. So what do you think that this technology is? Anybody has any clue? This is the world's first autonomously blood drawing robot created in the Netherlands. Been tested in a couple of hospitals already. And the aim is to put it in retail clinics. And one last piece of technology, the first reusable tampons that not only measures volume, but also all kinds of bio, uh, biomarkers is also available already. So what this brings is a continuously stream of data that gives us also the opportunity to come more in the front end of it, like the early diagnostics, early warning, fixing stuff before it happens. And Daniel asked me how, I uh, how I'm doing, and well, I, I slept well, not only today, but also the rest of the week and the rest of the month. And if you are interested in my pulse temperature, I can share that with you as well, or my gait, my EKG, of course, as well. Why is this important? This is a phone company out of Silicon Valley. And all of a sudden, this technology is now coming into this, what I like to call, consumer market. While at the other end, we now see clinical proven devices like this, the first clinical proven watch full scale, becoming available. So this is closing the gap between consumer and clinical in the end. And also augmented reality. My friend Raphael talked about this. You're able now it, to watch your football, your soccer game on your smartphone while the match is being played on the, on the grass. I don't get it, by the way. It's the same like in, at, con at concerts, everybody's gazing at a screen while the, the music uh, musicians are on stage. But again, this gives me also the opportunity of thinking about the, what we've seen in Star Trek back in the days. And if you fiddle around with AI, you can see how this in the end plays out. To me, this clearly signals, uh, signals a difference in the era that we're running into. From using old data, inclu including or from scientific literature, now using recent data and coming up real-time data. And with it, the aspect of the data changes from static to predictalytics right now to, pre to prescriptalytics in the end. And like I said, I'm coming from the ambulance services in the early days, and I will meet the day that an ambulance will knock on my door at my home, and I would open up, I would see two former colleagues, and say, hey guys, what's up? And one of those would say, well, we're fine. We're here for the cardiac arrest. And I would say, there's no cardiac arrest here. And one of them would say, Lucian, take a seat. In 2.3 minutes, it's going to happen. 
That's the thing that we're aiming for right now. So we will be present at the moment in time when somebody becomes sick and gets sick as opposed to fixing things at the end. So we now see that the system is not sustainable anymore. We cannot cope with it. New technology is coming up and the consumer is awakening. The consumer is also your patient. And why this matters is this. Anybody idea on clue what this is? No, it's not a wrongly figured Japanese flag. It's the only one hour that a patient with Parkinson's disease, our great friend Saori Gara from Sweden, visits her neurologist. And the other 8,765 hours, she's on her own. And the thing she does is she goes into the supermarket and she goes to the drugstore and all that. So why are we not using massively those touch points already for the patients to be utilized in healthcare to be earlier in the process? And that's why we've created a program which I called Healthcare Meets Retail. Together with a great bunch of companies in the Netherlands, already 35 partners, we're now trying to create this, what we like to call this Copernical moment. Copernic proved in the mid 1500s that the sun was not circling the earth, but it's the other way around. Still, the patient needs to circle the professional. And with all the technology, we have the opportunity to do it also in the other way around. Like we are doing that in our hospital in Ruhrmont with the self-measurement kiosk, where the patient would jump on, we'll take his blood pressure, his oxygenation, his, his weight, and now still in the hospital, but very soon hopefully also in drugstores. Why not? In the Netherlands already, the GP does not refer in many places directly anymore to the medical specialist, but the optometrician is doing that job. Those are the things that are changing. And maybe in due time, you'll see this kind of technology in these retail places to run from that. So where this brings us, I think, is that with real-time data at one end, my personal nutrition plans, for instance, and the drivers of health will bring to me a different cash receipt with all the things that are beneficial for me being lowered in price, and the things that are bad for me will be this uptake for that. Sure enough, Daniel and I will go run groceries for each other to kind of cope with that, as you can imagine, but still. And the thing is that due to the fact that we're always online already, and the pace is picking up, where airline industries took 70 years to reach 100 million people, Facebook done that in four years, and Instagram in two months, we also see how this has impacted our everyday life and in society. We've seen this happening in travel and media and music, and now, Healthcare is next. And I've er learned early on from our business family that if somebody is talking about me at a table and I'm not sitting at that table, I'm on the menu. <laughs> Healthcare's on the menu. This is a graph from my latest book, assembled with investments over a hundred million bucks from non-traditional healthcare players in healthcare. So this is happening, and some of you already have seen this, like Amazon now offering for $5 a month a subscription for the 40 most used generic drugs, all you can eat. I think this is worrisome. What to think about an analyst that says Apple is going to launch its own healthcare insurance program by 2024. Or TikTok buying 13 Chinese hospitals already. This is the reality. So let me wrap up with a question. What kind of company do you think for 150 euros, which is roughly the same as a dollar right now, would run a full health body scan based on 50 million health data points? What kind of company would that be, Jaina? Spotify. Spotify, thank you very much, my friend. Sister from another mother. So that's the reality. The founder of Spotify has created this company, and when they've opened up in Stockholm, in two hours they have 5,000 admissions of clients coming in for that. So we're living in an interesting time. If this picture says something to you, it says something about your day and age, as, as of mine, by the way. But. So the other interesting thing that's happening in Europe is the European health data space. And my friend and colleague, Herko Komers from the Ministry of Health, will talk about that, I think, Wednesday, where we have the opportunity and also mandatory that every citizen will have his own data. So this is going to happen right now, not only empowering the individuals, but also creating better diagnostics, better treatment, those kind of things. And in the end, also the standardization into it. 
So with that, I think also the patients included aspect is, is gaining momentum, where we also can use all that technology, because we often talk about that patient journey. But the reality is the majority of the patient journeys are journeys of a patient in an institution. Of course, there's also the, uh, the journey of life, of course, in the end. So let's start innovating together with patients. The next era will be patients innovating themselves. And that will bring a whole new array of possibilities. Healthcare will become delocalized. It will be democratized. It will be digital. And in the end of the day, it also will be about big dollars, big companies. So help me closing that tap and going and reaching out to the front end of the problem as opposed to fixing stuff at the rear end of that. With that, I would like to leave you also with some information if that's needed.